I'm Dr. Michael Hickson, and I'm an Associate Professor of Philosophy here at Trent University. I've been here for about 10 years, and currently at the time of filming anyway, I'm Chair of the Department of Philosophy. I'll be talking to you today about critical thinking in philosophy. Critical thinking is used in every academic discipline, not just philosophy, and generally it means something like the systematic evaluation of the quality of one's beliefs. So when we think critically, what we're doing is questioning the foundation of our individual beliefs or even of our entire belief system. In philosophy, though, the meaning of critical thinking is a bit narrower uh, because in philosophy, we always base our beliefs and our belief systems in arguments. And there are other videos that the philosophy department is putting together that talk to you about arguments and how to identify them. So I'll leave that work to some of the other videos. Uh, so in philosophy, critical thinking is going to mean the systematic evaluation of the quality of arguments, since those are the foundation of our beliefs. So when we think critically, as philosophers, we analyze the arguments that we or others put forward as the basis of the conclusions that we or these other people believe. So if we're going to engage in critical thinking, we need to know about arguments, and it's helpful to make some distinctions. So in general, there are two kinds of arguments that we have in philosophy, deductive arguments and inductive arguments. Deductive arguments are arguments whose premises are intended to establish the conclusion with the highest degree of certainty possible. Whereas inductive arguments are arguments whose premises are intended to render the conclusion only probable because it's the best that you can do, perhaps. For the rest of this uh, video, I'm just going to focus on deductive arguments for the interest of time. So here's an example of a deductive argument. Premise one, all humans are mortal. Premise two, Hypatia was a, uh, was a human. And conclusion, Hypatia was mortal. So this is a deductive argument because the premises establish the conclusion with absolute certainty. And here's how you can see that. So here's a diagram of the argument. The outer circle is all mortal things. The inner circle is all humans and the star represents the individual human, Hypatia. So in that last argument that we looked at, premise one said that all humans are mortal. So we've represented that in this diagram by placing the circle of humans completely within the circle of mortal things. Then our second premise was that Hypatia was human, so we placed the star Hypatia within the circle human. And then notice, as soon as you have finished diagramming the two premises, you have led yourself immediately to the conclusion, namely that Hypatia was mortal. Because just by drawing the premises, we have forced the star Hypatia to fall totally within the circle of mortal things. So the conclusion has been established with absolute certainty by the premises. So an argument like the one we just considered is called a valid argument. And in general, every structurally good deductive argument like that one is called valid. In philosophy, we like to give definitions, so we should get more precise and give a definition of a valid argument. So we say that a deductive argument is valid whenever the following criterion is satisfied. If the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So for any argument that's deductive, if that criterion holds, then you can say that the argument is a valid one. But we have to be careful when we're thinking critically about arguments. Validity is not everything, because validity is just a formal characteristic of arguments. It's only about structure. Some arguments are valid, but they're laughably bad. So here's an example of that. Premise one, all cats are whales. Premise two, all whales are snails. And then conclusion, all cats are snails. That's a valid argument. From a structural point of view, it's perfectly fine. But obviously, we don't want to call that a good argument because the conclusion is clearly false. So we have to introduce another characteristic of arguments that we're going to look for as critical thinkers. And that characteristic is soundness. So we call a completely good deductive argument 
a sound argument, and that is one that is a deductive argument that's valid and that also has all true premises. So in that last ridiculous argument that we looked at, soundness was not satisfied because both of the premises were false. So soundness and not merely validity is going to be the goal that we're after when we are writing deductive philosophical arguments in philosophy. So in summary, so far, a deductive argument that's structurally good is called valid, and a valid argument that has true premises is called sound. But a deductive argument that's structurally bad is called invalid, and a deductive argument that has at least one false premise is called unsound. So it's helpful to have these characteristics and these names because as we're thinking critically about arguments, they focus our attention on certain aspects of arguments. So let's get uh, down to some nuts and bolts of how are you as a critical thinker going to identify a valid argument. Step one, you're going to have to read the entire argument. Make sure you understand it, right? Step two, identify the premises and the conclusions. So separate those out. And step three, ask yourself, if I assume all the premises are true, am I forced to accept the conclusion as true? That's the critical thinking question that you're going to ask about deductive arguments. And step four, if the answer to that question is yes, then the argument is valid. But if the answer is no, then it's invalid. So let's take an example. The sidewalk in front of my apartment is wet. The sky is very cloudy. I hear the rumbling of thunder in the distance. Therefore, it has just rained. Is this argument valid? Take a second and look at it. You might have to pause uh, the video to do so, but take a look at it and go through those steps that I just outlined for identifying validity or invalidity. Once you've done that, you should come to the conclusion that no, it's not a valid argument. We are not forced by the premises to accept the conclusion as true. And that's because it's possible that somebody sprayed the sidewalk with a hose. And that, but not rain, is how it got wet. So thinking critically often involves imagining alternative possibilities in, in this kind of a way. Now what about soundness? How do you identify that? So step one, the first thing you need to do is identify whether the argument is valid because all sound arguments are valid. Step two, if the argument is valid, then continue by asking whether each individual premise is true. And step three, if the answer is yes, then the argument is sound. But then we get the ultimate question, how do you identify the truth? I mean, there can't be a, a bigger, more complicated question than that, and we're obviously not going to solve that in a short video. But suffice to say that we search for truth in a variety of ways by, for example, consulting our experience, uh, our sensory observations, we can consult respected experts, and we can look to the established findings of academic disciplines like history, psychology, physics, math, etc. So a practical approach to soundness might be this. We can say that a deductive argument is sound, first of all, if it's valid, and then if its premises conform with reliable past experience, the testimony of our senses, the opinions of experts, and the established findings of academic disciplines. So you're going to have to bring everything you know to an argument if you're going to identify whether it's sound or not. All right, so that's going to conclude what I have to say about good arguments, and now we'll move from good arguments to identifying bad arguments. This is a little bit uh, trickier because there's only one way for a deductive argument to be good. It has to be sound, and we've shown just what a narrow uh, concept soundness is. But there are innumerable ways for arguments to be bad. So how do you study those systematically? Well, it turns out that some of these ways are very common and they have a very familiar structure. So we can, uh, we can identify them, give them their own names, and it helps us to study them carefully. We call uh, the characteristics of bad arguments fallacies, and I only have time to look at about three of them today. So let's look at three of the most common fallacies, the ad hominem, begging the question, and slippery slope. Ad hominem is a Latin term meaning against the man. 
And the reason why it has that name is because the fallacy involves attacking the person who makes the argument rather than attacking their argument itself. So here's an example. Nothing Donald Trump said in last night's debate should be believed because he is an immoral person and maybe also a criminal. Now, whatever else you think about Donald Trump, you have to admit that his arguments are good or bad based on whether their premises establish their conclusion. His arguments are independent from his moral character. So this argument here that I've just given is not a good argument. It's a fallacy. And in particular, it's the fallacy ad hominem. Another fallacy that's very common is called begging the question. And you have to be careful because this phrase begging the question is very often misused. So it's common to hear in the news media, for example, somebody saying something like uh, wildfires are blazing all over the world and this begs the question, when are we finally going to do something about climate change? Well, what the person actually means is that the wildfires raise the question. You know, they lead us to ask the question, when are we going to do something about climate change? They don't beg the question, because begging the question has a very specific meaning within philosophy. And begging the question means any fallacy that um, defends a conclusion by using that very same conclusion as one of the premises in the argument. So another, another name for begging the question is a circular argument. So here's an example. God wrote the Bible. God cannot lie. So everything the Bible says is true. The Bible says that God exists. Therefore, God must exist. This is an argument that is probably the basis for a lot of people's belief in God. But as it stands, this argument is a bad one. It's fallacious because it begs the question. That's because the conclusion, God must exist, is implied in the very first premise of the argument. God wrote the Bible. God cannot write the Bible unless God exists. So we are assuming the conclusion in order to support the conclusion, and that's bad reasoning. Finally, slippery slope is one of the most common fallacies. It involves stipulating without proof that some innocent act, if committed, will soon snowball into something awful. So for example, if you have one drink of alcohol, it will so soon turn into two, then three, then 50. And the next thing you know, you're an alcoholic. So you should therefore stay away from alcohol. Well, it's possible that having one drink of alcohol will not turn into two or three or 50 and that you won't be an alcoholic. So as a matter of fact, having one drink of alcohol uh, is probably not something that you have to worry about. What you should worry about are those other consequences. You should try not to have 50 drinks. Uh, so it's not the one drink that's the problem, it's the 50. And the person making this argument hasn't shown us that there's any necessity between going from one to 50. So what they've instead tried to do is use fear tactics, which is a, a, a technique of persuasion to try to get us to stay away from alcohol. Okay. That's all the time that I have today. We haven't had time to look at all arguments. For example, we haven't looked at all at inductive arguments. And we've only just scratched the surface of fallacies. So where can you go from here? Well, at Trent University, we offer two courses that continue the study of arguments. Phil 1200 Critical Thinking is a great course that uh, will look at both deductive and inductive arguments as well as fallacies. And Phil 2410 Symbolic Logic is a deep dive into deductive reasoning. Uh, I teach both of those courses, and I would look forward to seeing you in them at some point in the future. Uh, in the meantime, thanks very much for joining me, and all the best with your studies.